Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea and Philippia. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, what do you, or who do you say I am? Peter had answered, you are the Christ. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forget to forfeit, forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words and this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them, of him, when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. May the Lord bless our understanding of these words. All righty. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Oh, come on. My first week back. I know you can do better than that. Good morning. Good morning. There it is. That's the energy we need. Good morning. Got to get out the energy before all this rain comes. That way you can take a nap, you know, have a good time, chill out, kick on Netflix or whatever it is you do at home, read a book. Well, good morning, good morning, and welcome to Bethany Christian Church, all of you who are members, our guests who are here with us today, it's good to see you, and those of you who are joining us online as well, thank you so much for being here. Um, I have been on vacation for a while, and for those of you that uh, are meeting me for the first time or uh, have never seen me before, I don't normally wear a suit on Sunday, <laughs> um, I'm usually a lot more casual, but uh, Brianna, my fiance, and I were uh, taking engagement photos this morning, so... We had, to, we had to look pretty today. Thank you, thank you. We're getting married April 27th, so it's coming up. Really excited, really excited. Um, so yes, two weeks ago I was here, and uh, for those of you who might not remember or weren't here with us, we talked about uh, Moses, and Moses in the book of Deuteronomy, the last in the, what is called the Pentateuch, the five first books of the Bible. Moses writes Deuteronomy to the people of Israel and. He, what he's doing in this part of Deuteronomy that we talked about is he's given a couple of sermons. He's kind of setting the stage for the next chapter in the story of the people of Israel. And he's calling the people of Israel to look back on the faithfulness of God before they move forward into this next chapter of their story, into the promised land that God had promised to Abraham so many generations ago. And so today, I'm going to try to consider some of these obstacles that are, we face as we enter our promised land. We think about this kingdom mindset and what questions come with that. So my friends, if you would bow your heads with me in a posture of prayer, let us pray together. Lord Jesus, we ask that you would be here, that your spirit would be among us and within us, Lord God, I ask that you would speak to us and that you would speak through the words that you have given me to talk about today. God, I ask that you would teach us to reflect on this kingdom mindset and how it is different from the kingdoms of this world that we try to build for ourselves, for nations, and for power. Lord God, give us grace and show us what it is that you have to show us today. 
We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So in all of my experience with church and theology, I have found that it is very popular for us as Christians to declare who God is. To declare who God is. In the typical American church, we have a typical orthodox understanding of God. We call things, we call God things like all-powerful, all-knowing, always present, all good. We call God our creator, our sustainer, our redeemer. We call God a shepherd, a king, a parent, a light. We say things like, God is love, God is holy, God is just, and God is merciful. In our passage today, we get another title for God. Peter calls Jesus the Messiah, the Christ. He calls Jesus the Deliverer, the one who is going to liberate the Jewish people from the oppression of the Romans. He gives Jesus, the visible image of the invisible God, a title, a positive title. This is an affirmation from Peter of who he believes Jesus is. And as we have talked about in the past, this title, Messiah, it's a loaded term. It comes with a history. In the history of the Jewish people, messiahs have come and gone. They have liberated the Jewish people in the past. And the best example that we have is actually in the Old Testament. It's someone named Cyrus the Great, who ironically is not Jewish at all. Cyrus the Great is actually a Persian king, and he's the only person in the Old Testament, actually the only person other than Jesus in the Bible, who's referred to in the language that it was written as a messiah. And so Cyrus the Great, this Persian king, the reason he's called a Messiah is because he returns the Israelites from exile in Babylon. But the Messiah that Peter is referring to in this case is actually much different. This is the last Messiah. This is the last deliverer. According to Peter's understanding up to this point in the story, Jesus is the last person in a long line of prophets and messiahs that is going to set the world of the Jewish people right. He is supposed to topple Rome so that Israel can return to its former glory with one of David's descendants ruling the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. Peter is declaring that Jesus is God's plan for God's people. In Matthew's telling of this story, Peter says this, That Jesus is the Messiah. But Matthew adds this next piece. He says that he's the Messiah, the Son of the living God. He is making a theological claim in Matthew. In theological language, we call this cataphatic theology. Peter is making a claim about what God is like. But we know that this isn't the end of the encounter as we just read. In verse 30, we read that Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him after he receives this title. And then in verse 31, we read that Jesus begins to teach them about the rest of the story, that Jesus is going to suffer, that he is going to be rejected by the religious leaders, and that he will die and rise again in three days. But then what happens next? Take a look at verse 32. Jesus spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Peter told Jesus that he was wrong about how this story was going to end. Let me say that again if you didn't catch that. Peter told Jesus that he was wrong and that he didn't understand how this story was going to end. Peter told Jesus, Peter told God what God's ministry was going to look like. 
what his beliefs about God were. Because Peter insisted telling God what Peter's theology of God was. What his beliefs about God were. Peter insisted that God in the flesh, this guy Jesus, didn't know how the whole Messiah thing worked. He said, no, you don't understand, Jesus. Let me tell you how this is going to go. And what did God say? What did Jesus say? Look at verse 33. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in your mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Jesus, God himself, looked at Peter and said, that his cataphatic theology, his understanding of who God is, of what God is like, Jesus said, no, 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 no. Peter, you've got it wrong. I wonder how many times we create a cataphatic theology. We create a theology of what God is like, and Jesus might look at us and say, get behind me, Satan. I wonder. I wonder if any of us ever consider the opposite of a cataphatic theology. Theology. I wonder if we ever think to consider what God is like, but also what God is not like. We call this theology of what God is not like apophatic theology. Apophatic theology. And I think that the words of Jesus here actually invite us into considering an apophatic theology in this case. You might remember that earlier in the Gospels, Jesus is driven out into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit to be tempted by Satan. He tells Peter, get behind me, Satan. I think this is a callback to what happens earlier in the story. Matthew's Gospel is the first time that this Satan appears in the, first, or in the New Testament. And you might remember that Jesus is tempted with three things. Jesus is tempted with food while he's fasting. The second temptation is to test God, whether if he threw himself off of the pinnacle of the temple, would the angels save him? And then his third temptation is that he might worship Satan to gain control of all the kingdoms of the world. Well, for our time today, I want to zero in on this last temptation that Jesus receives in the wilderness. Jesus is tempted to fall down and worship Satan in order that he might be given control over the entire world. I wonder if this sounds familiar with what we just read. Do you remember what Peter was just rebuked for? Wasn't Peter just rebuked for insisting that his understanding, his belief, his theology of Jesus taking political control over the known world? I mean, that's what was supposed to happen, right? That's what the Messiah is here for. That's what God is supposed to do with this Messiah. I've been, I've been wrestling with this for a long time because the implications of this are pretty bleak. And for me, the, the questions don't end with the temptation in the desert. It goes all the way through the end of the gospel when Jesus is speaking to Peter during his arrest in the garden of Gethsemane. Jesus says in Matthew 26, verse 53, do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? This is his question to Peter after Peter insists on unsheathing his dagger and fighting to keep them away from his beloved Jesus. He says, don't you know I have it in my power? Don't you know I have it in my power to call down thousands to take them out? But Jesus chose not to. I think about the religious leaders trying to trap Jesus by asking him about paying taxes. Jesus tells them in Matthew chapter 22, verse 21, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things which are God's. I think I'm left with more questions than answers in all of this. 
trying to understand this Jesus, this Messiah. But I think we can begin to see through these vignettes of the life of Jesus what I'm calling the kingdom mindset. And I think apophatic theology, the theology of what God is not, gives us a window through which we can more clearly see it. Remember, this apophatic theology is saying what God is not like, as opposed to what God is like. So what can we learn from Jesus' temptation to power? What is the life of Jesus teaching us about what God is not like? Well, I think we can safely say that the kingdom of God is not about political domination. To put it more bluntly, God is not like earthly kings. God is not interested in domination. God did not come into the world to conquer the world. And yet, Jesus says this line repeatedly throughout his ministry, that the kingdom, he uses the word kingdom, of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is at hand. So what does it then mean to have a kingdom mindset? What does God's definition of justice here and now look like? What does it mean for us as followers of this Messiah to take seriously that God himself resisted the temptation to political power and earthly authority? Well, Jesus tells Peter, you're, you're thinking like a human. You're not thinking like God. So then what does it mean to think like God? What does it mean to act in the world as God would act? What does it look like to have this kingdom mindset? How might we have to redefine kingdom for Bethany Christian Church? What does the kingdom mindset look like for each and every one of us here and now with an election looming over us? We can't all pretend people aren't talking about it, that they aren't stressed about it, that they aren't scared because of it. What would it look like to have that kingdom mindset? To have God's concerns, not human concerns, when we encounter those conversations in our day-to-day -day lives? Are we going to look at God and say, no, 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 God, you don't understand. The election needs to go this way. My candidate wins or I'm throwing in the towel. I wonder if God would look at us in that day, just as he did to Peter 2,000 years ago, and say, get behind me, Satan. You don't have the kingdom mindset. Your mind is set on human things, not godly things. And I wonder, and I hope, that God would be kinder about it in my case. I hope that Jesus would take at least, would at least take me by the hand and look me in the eye and say, my son, why do you worry about these things? Don't you remember what I told my disciples so many years ago? Remember, Landon, I told them that in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. Amen.